In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today, as we continue on in the small catechism, we look at the third commandment. Thou shalt sanctify the holy day. Martin Luther asked, what does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we may not despise preaching and his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. Paul has received messages lately that say going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than standing in your garage makes you a car. Kind of a stupid statement. If you don't put your car in a garage or at least wash it, it gets rusty. If you don't maintain it, it falls apart and it dies. So is the life of the Christian. When we don't come into the Lord's house, our faith will shrivel up. It will become rusty, and it's in peril of death. Thou shalt sanctify the holy day. We should fear and love God so that we may not despise preaching and his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. We get this one wrong in so many ways. We don't even realize how on some Sundays we get up and we go to church and we sleep through the sermon because, well, we're mostly here to see old friends, drink some coffee, and have a pastry. Sometimes we don't listen because we think we know better than that silly pastor up there. He's just a big goofball anyway. Some Sundays... You just would rather stay in bed where you're distracted with other fascinations of this world. But we come to church, and here we receive gifts. When you see church as a gift-giving place, it's a little more pleasant to go there. How will we receive the gifts of salvation unless we first admit that we lack that gift? In and of ourselves, we are nothing but sinful. But God's grace and his mercy is a gift. We also get this wrong when we come to church as though it's an obligation. I went to church on Sunday, I gave God my hour, now I'm good for the week. That's not the way it works either. So we ask the question, what is the Sabbath day, or as Luther puts it, the holy day? In the Old Testament, we take a look at the creation account. Six days God creates, and on the seventh day, he rests. Well, that's a pretty good model for us, I would say. Six days labor, seventh day off. We're given this day for a day of relaxation. And a day of pondering the goodness of God. A day of considering what God has done for us, first in creating us, and second, in redeeming us. In short, the Sabbath day is a day of worship. But Jesus makes it clear that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. You remember the story there where Jesus is walking along with his disciples, and they're hungry, and it's on the Sabbath day, and so they grab some heads of wheat, and they're kind of mashing the outer husk out and eating the nuggets, you know, kind of like eating a peanut. And the Sadducees and the Pharisees and all the Judaizers of old and the Jews of old, whatever, were pretty upset with these guys for working on the Sabbath day, opening the husk. Shame on you, Jesus. Have you no shame? Jesus makes it clear. The Sabbath is a gift for us. We are not slaves to the Sabbath. You see... This is when we get it wrong. We look at church as though something that we have to do to obey God's law. And when we look at the Sabbath in the way of the law, we start asking the wrong questions. If we have to rest, have to rest, like that's a bad thing, I have to rest here, then what can we get away with doing? You see, when you have work to do, you're trying to slough off, and when you have sloughing off to do, you need to work. Anything to go against God, right? Instead of the Sabbath of being an invitation, 
where we're invited to rest and have the security of our Savior on the Sabbath, Jesus invites us, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Jesus gives us Sabbath rest. He sets us free from the need to earn, to work out our salvation. Instead of coming and worshiping God, receiving the gifts, we look at it as, what can I get away with? Would you hurry up and finish the sermon? i got to go to the beach, right? Is there a specific way in which we're supposed to worship? Well, a lot of people say that there's the historic liturgy, like as if Lutherans always worship the same everywhere. In Luther's day, there were a lot of different worships in a lot of different regions amongst the Lutherans. The Jews kept the Sabbath, or Shabbat, on the seventh day or on Saturday. There are some Christian denominations that worship on Saturday and some pseudo-Christian denominations, and they'll condemn us for worshiping on Sunday. There are some that insist that we've made a grievous error by worshiping on Sunday instead of Saturday. So why do we worship on Sunday instead of Saturday? Because we're free to. Colossians 2, 16 and 17 says, Therefore let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink. Don't you judge me about my bacon. Or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. Jesus has not specified a day that we are to worship him. Since he hasn't specified a day that we are to set aside to worship Jesus, we are to worship him every day. Consider that one. Our life should be a life of worship. We wake up in the morning and give God thanks for keeping us safely through the night, and we ask him to bless our day and to keep us from sin. We go to bed, we confess that we've sinned today, And we ask him to watch over and protect us through the night. We live a life of worship. Jesus didn't specify a day. And in Christian liberty, we can gather every day if we darn well like. Romans 14, 5 through 6. One person esteems one day is better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. In all things, let us give thanks to God. We live a life of Sabbath. The early church worshipped on Sundays. From the earliest of days, they worshipped on Sundays, going all the way back to Acts 20. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day and prolonged his speech until midnight. You think it's bad when I go 25 minutes. Paul talked until midnight. The apostles worshipped on Sunday. Sunday is the resurrection day. God creates in six days, rests on the seventh, recreates on the eighth. So now Sunday is the beginning and the end of our week. We enter Kairos, a time outside of time. Here in church, we get a taste, a foretaste of the feast to come. We're not compelled to worship on one day or another. Not on Saturday, not on Sunday. We certainly have the liberty in Christ to gather every day or any day. We could have church on Friday mornings if we liked. Most people would be at work, but we could. We gather around the word and the sacraments. That is church. God's people around God's things. Whenever we do that, there is church. Many people believe that they can worship God in their own way at home or out in the woods by themselves. The problem is we're called to gather in his name, and when we do so, he will be in our midst. And where there is God, where there is Jesus Christ, there is mercy, forgiveness, and grace. And so we gather in his name and we receive his good things. What a blessing it is that our Lord calls us together to hear the stories of his wondrous love for us, of the wondrous things that he's done for us, also the things he's done for all of creation. We hear of Christ's perfect life lived out for us. 
as we're so imperfect ourselves. We hear about his atoning sacrifice, giving up his body and blood for us, taking our death upon himself. We hear about his resurrection, which is promised to us, and now we gather around his table to dine with him, who is our Savior. Why would you not want to be here? Church is a gift place. In Jesus' name, amen.